So we had a very productive two years. We passed, I'm thinking, over 160 measures, and more than 93% of them achieved bipartisan support on the House floor, and probably half of them passed unanimously. We reauthorized agencies and programs that had not gone through that process, sometimes in decades. You heard about Ray Bomzak, uh, 28 years since the FCC was last reauthorized. But we also reauthorized the Safe Drinking Water Act and uh, Brownfields legislation, among others, that have been uh, decades or more since they were reviewed. We modernized the drug and medical device approval process at the FDA. We got rid of therapy caps for Medicare patients and opened the hearing aid market to competition. And most importantly, we tackled the opioid epidemic in America, where more people die from opioid overdose than in traffic accidents. And we approved more than 60 individual pieces of legislation through the committee and across the House floor that we eventually bundled up into one bill so the Senate could take it up, and it became law last fall. Seldom in this job do you have the opportunity to say your work will literally save lives. This legislation will do that. We will save lives. And in December, we released our investigative report on how this scourge took hold across the country. I would encourage you to go read that. It is extraordinary work done by our ONI team, led by Greg Harper and Jen Barbla. Um, they did a terrific job. I think it's over 380 pages uh, documenting as a test case what happened in West Virginia, what happened at the DEA, what happened across the entire sector, and then where we need to go going forward. We also fully funded the Children's Health Insurance Program for 10 years. That's double the length of any other reauthorization funding of CHIP, which is so important. 127,000 Oregonians rely on CHIP every year for health care. And we gave record support for our community health centers as well. Unfortunately, some of our best work ended up in the Senate paper shredder, including the outstanding efforts of John Shimkus to solve our nation's nuclear waste storage mess, he garnered 340 votes in the House on the bipartisan legislation we sent over there, but unfortunately could not gain the support in the Senate. And Bob Latta's efforts to write a nationwide law governing autonomous vehicles, design, production, we want that done here. We want the Innovation of America. It got unanimous support out of the committee and across the House floor, but like the work on nuclear waste, did not get the necessary votes needed in the Senate. So where does the Energy and Commerce Committee go from here? Well, you all know everything changes. Chairman Pallone will now have two-thirds of the staff, and I'll have one-third. And I want you to know I'm a fan of President Ford, so the hike across to see those staff in the Ford building will be just fine. <laughs> fine. <laughs> oh, and who really needs an office over in the hideaways in the Capitol anyway? It's just one more key you have to carry. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> hey, I get a new pin today, you know? <laughs> You know, Frank and I have actually worked pretty well together, and our staffs do as, too, as well. We fought on the things where we disagreed. We fought hard at times. You saw that. But we also worked together to empower our members and pass legislation to solve America's problems. The proof is in the product, again, with over 93% of those bills achieving bipartisan support in the House. But look, bold new House majorities overreach. We did. They will. This is especially true in wave years like 2018 was. With 63, I think it is, new Democrats, the proof, uh, the, uh, they will definitely have this problem, especially with their progressive slash socialist wing of the party. I know they'll have to satisfy their hardcore base. So what does that mean? It means that they have to take quick action on things like net neutrality, things like the new clean deal, and frankly, Medicare for all, or their base will go into complete meltdown. And I think you'll see a focus also on drug pricing. I hope the committee under Mr. Pallone will continue my focus to put consumers first when it makes decisions about public policy. I hope the Democrats will continue our work to identify the cost drivers, frankly, throughout the health care industry, because what people care about most is what it actually costs them out of pocket for their health care, as well as getting access. We identified problems with the 340B program, and we're prepared to look at every sector of the industry to shine light in dark spaces of medical costs and bring about real change for consumers. But that may not be enough for the Democrat left. Remember, they're having a fight over PAYGO today. While the left got their climate crisis select committee, they got it without legislative or subpoena authority. So they're not happy about that either. And just for the record, I served on the last climate committee, which also didn't have any teeth. It really seemed duplicative and sometimes at odds with the, frankly, Energy and Commerce Committee. 
Chairman Pallone is perfectly capable of moving a progressive climate crisis bill in the Energy and Commerce Committee. The Commerce Committee will need to reauthorize community health centers this year, and it will need to decide what to do in the video marketplace with the coming expiration of Stella. There's more work to be done to close the digital divide in America. The committee will need to develop legislation on data security and privacy, two very tough but very important issues. And we'll need to pick up where Susan Brooks' work left off to modernize the Pandemic All Hazard Preparedness Act, which, as you know, got hung up in the Senate. And we need to review the opioids legislation we just passed and look at things that we need to do going forward in that space, as well as take another look at 21st century cures, which Fred Upton led on and Diana get so ably in the last Congress, uh, to make changes and investments where necessary. We still have work to do on energy development, including oil, gas, nuclear, and renewables. America leads in all of these categories, but we need to work even more to spur innovation in each category of the energy sector while achieving further reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Meanwhile, I fully anticipate the Democrats will devote enormous resources to investigating anything and everything Trump. And in this case, they now have the subpoena authority to back up their efforts. But these investigations can drag on for years, and administrations of both parties know how to batten down the hatches and slow walk responses to requests, demands, and subpoenas. And you'll recall that under the Obama administration, the House found Attorney General uh, Eric Holder in contempt of Congress. And let's see, where's he today? There aren't many teeth in a congressional subpoena, quite frankly. So what are they to do? Threaten to lock Zinke in a room with Grijalva? Or have Ivanka shackled to a table and cannon? <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> it can happen. I don't know. Meanwhile, the American people will want results. And if the Democrats yield too much to their progressive activists, then how will their grand plans ever make it through the Republican Senate or across the president's desk? You do need to legislate and enact laws. So to succeed at legislating, one does have to do more than satisfy the most extreme in the crowd. And if they go too far, 2020 might look a lot like 2010. After all, some 33 Democrats are now in seats that President Trump won. And while the Democrats did a marvelous job of recruiting candidates, and they did, most rode the wave named check and balance. They're going to need legislative results, not government shutdowns. So with that, thank you for letting me share a few comments with you. And I'd be happy to uh, take any questions that you might have. So Mr. Chairman, um, we're in the middle of a government shutdown right now. And yesterday, uh, the president hosted negotiations I, that got me to thinking, wondering, how many sides are there at, the, at this negotiating table? It's a big table. Um, but it gets down to three players. And they're the President of the United States, the Democrat leader of the Senate, and the new Speaker of the House. At the end of the day, you've got to get 60 votes in the Senate, and you have to get a majority in the House. And I, I think it, it really gets down to that. And then who's going to yield? Donald Trump? Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi. And so we may be in this for a while. Now, I, I would just say that um, big countries, big governments need to be able to get their budgets done and keep their agencies operating. And I hope we can get to a day when whoever's in charge, that occurs, so we can deal with the real public policy issues. Now, I know there's a lot we need to do on the wall. I know there's a lot we need to do on border security. We also need to reform the immigration laws in America, and we had a chance this summer to do that. And I voted for both good lap proposals because I wanted to move something forward on both these areas. And the president could add $25 billion in border security this summer, and we could have solved the DACA problem and some of the other immigration problems. Now, he needed some tweaks. I wasn't sold on everything in the package, but it would have gotten us off dead center. And unfortunately, we lost that opportunity. We find ourselves in a pretty big box canyon. But at least the, uh, the bad guys on the rim have rifles, so it's all good. It's great sitting there. 